Hello, and welcome to the TI Precision Lab introducing DC specifications. Overall, this section will cover the specifications listed in a typical ADC datasheet. In this video, we will define input capacitance, leakage current, input impedance, reference voltage range, integral nonlinearity, and differential nonlinearity. Let's start with input capacitance. The input sample and hold capacitance of a SAR ADC is normally specified in the datasheet. At the top of this slide, we show an excerpt from the ADS9110 datasheet, indicating that the input capacitance is typically 60 picofarads when in sample mode and 4 picofarads in hold mode. The SAR ADC simplified model shown on the left helps us get a basic idea of what sample mode and hold mode mean. In sample mode, the switch S1 is closed. This connects the 60 picofarad capacitor to the external signal applied at the input A and P. The goal of the sampling process is to store the input signal on the sampling capacitor. The sample cycle is often called the acquisition cycle. In hold mode, the switch S1 is opened and the ADC will convert the sampled signal. This time period is often called the conversion cycle. While in hold mode, the input capacitance is equal to the parasitic capacitance of the input diode structure, which is typically 4 picofarads. A more detailed input structure showing the input diodes, resistances, capacitances, and switches is shown on the right. Now let's look at input leakage. The input leakage is a DC current that flows into or out of the data converter input pins. This current results from internal ESD protection structures and other parasitic structures. This current can be modeled as a DC current source on both ADC inputs and is typically in the nanoamp to microamp level. You can think of input leakage current to be similar to bias current on the input of an amplifier. Notice that the polarity can be in either direction. The example shown here illustrates how the bias current can generate an offset error when it flows through any source impedance. Notice in this example that a 10 microvolt error signal is developed on each input. In this case, the leakage current out of each input is plus 1 microamp, but in general, the polarity and magnitude may be different depending on device to device variation. In fact, the leakage current is given as a typical value, so the worst case leakage currents will be larger. The typical value represents plus or minus one standard deviation, or 68.3% of the devices manufactured. For an estimate of the maximum, you can use plus or minus three standard deviations for 99.7% of the population. The next specification is input impedance. In many cases, the input impedance of a data converter will be a dynamic impedance. Frequently, the dynamic impedance is the result of input leakage currents as well as the switching and charging of the input capacitance. However, some data converters have an amplifier input with a fixed impedance. The amplifier's fixed input impedance is generally from the resistance of its gain setting resistors. In this example, the ADC has an integrated programmable gain amplifier, or PGA, with a 1 megaohm input impedance. Connecting an external resistance will change the gain of the amplifier. If this resistance is unknown or a dynamic impedance, it will introduce a system gain error according to the equation given. In many cases, this error can be eliminated with a simple two-point calibration. If this resistance is known, it can be mathematically accounted for using the extended input range equation given. For example, if the specified ADC input range is 10 volts, connecting a 200 kiloohm external resistor will change the system input range to 12 volts. A detailed explanation of these effects is covered in the Analog Engineer's Circuit Cookbook documents shown on the slide. Next, we will look at the reference input voltage range. Most specifications in data converter datasheets will be defined for a specific reference voltage. Typically, this is the most popular reference voltage that will be used with this converter. Using any other reference voltage within the reference input voltage range should yield comparable performance to the specified datasheet performance. 
In some cases, curves in the datasheet will illustrate how key parameters are affected by different reference voltages. Shown here are some datasheet excerpts from the ADS9110 datasheet. In the data table, the specified reference range of 2.5 volts to 5 volts is given. The header at the top of the table indicates that the specifications are all defined with a VREF equal to 5 volts. The curves in the body of the datasheet can be used to better understand how adjusting the reference voltage will affect key parameters. The next specification to consider is the reference current. The reference input of a SAR data converter is connected to a bank of switched capacitors. During the conversion cycle, these capacitors will be switched into the comparison circuitry, and they will charge or discharge to the reference input voltage very rapidly. Typically, for each bit in a conversion cycle, you will see a large spike in the reference input current as the internal capacitor charges. The table shows an excerpt from the ADS8881 datasheet indicating that the typical reference input current is 300 microamps during conversion. Note that the specified current is actually an average current, as the actual current will show up as rapid large spikes, shown as 10 milliamps in this waveform example. Notice that the entire conversion period may be on the order of 100 nanoseconds and the time between current spikes may be tens of nanoseconds. Normally, a large filtering capacitor is placed at the reference input to respond to the rapid transient current requirements and the reference will provide the average current needed to replenish the capacitor between the sharp transients. Sometimes, a wide bandwidth buffer is required at the reference input to the ADC because of the relatively short time between the transients. Notice that the specification table also gives a recommended decoupling capacitor for the reference input. In order to discuss nonlinearities of ADCs, we first need to understand the ideal output of an ADC. Here we show the ideal transfer function for an ADC. The horizontal axis represents a continuous analog input signal. The vertical axis shows the digital output codes which can be thought of as levels for rounding off the analog input signal to its nearest digital equivalent. The full-scale input range of the ADC is equally divided over the total number of digital output codes to transform the dashed red line in this graph to the staircase blue line shown here. The number of bits, shown here as in, is the number of binary digits in the digital output code used to represent the full-scale analog signal. In this example, we have four bits or binary digits. The number of digital output codes is the total number of different binary words available for the digital output. The number of codes here is 16, which corresponds to counting from binary 0000 to 1111, which is 0 to 15 in decimal. Note that you can calculate the number of codes by taking 2 to the power of the number of bits. The resolution of the converter corresponds to the width of each analog step and is equivalent to the minimum resolvable change in analog input. The resolution is often identified as the width of the least significant bit. This can be computed by taking the full scale range and dividing by the total number of bits, or 2 to the n power. In this example, the least significant bit width or resolution can be calculated by dividing 2 volts by 16 to get a resolution of 0.125 volts. The full scale range in this example is 2 volts, but the maximum detectable input voltage is the full scale range minus 1 LSB, or 1.875 volts in this example. The first ADC nonlinearity is differential nonlinearity. DNL is a measurement of how the width of a code compares to the ideal width. The figure illustrates how some codes are longer than the ideal width and others are shorter. The equation shown illustrates how DNL is calculated. The equation is really an error calculation using the measured code width, WK, and the ideal code width, Q. The measured code width is calculated by subtracting the two adjacent code transitions TK and TK-1. If the measured code width is equal to the ideal code width, the DNL is zero. 
if the measured code is longer than the ideal code, the DNL is positive, and if the measured code is shorter, the DNL is negative. In some cases, the dynamic nonlinearity is large enough to cause a code transition to be completely skipped. This is called a missing code. The example here shows a case where the digital output of the ADC completely skips the code 1001. In this example, there is no analog input signal that will ever cause the digital output to read 1001. Missing codes can be a serious issue for many electronic systems, so most modern ADCs are designed and tested to ensure that they will not have this problem. In fact, datasheets often provide a no missing code or NMC specification to highlight that the converter will not have missing codes. The excerpt above shows an example of the no missing code specification. This slide shows an example of how the differential nonlinearity specification is shown in the datasheets. For each code in the transfer function, we compare the measured code width to the ideal code width. Thus, one way that this specification can be displayed is a graph of DNL versus ADC output code. In our simplified example, you can see the DNL versus ADC code for a 3-bit converter. The calculation for code 101 is shown. This bit is 31 millivolts wide, which is short compared to the ideal width of 125 millivolts, so the DNL is negative. The plot on the right shows a more practical example of an 18-bit converter. In this case, thousands of DNL measurements are being displayed, and you can see that the DNL is typically less than one half of an LSB. At the top of a page is an example of a DNL specification. The minimum and maximum limits on this specification indicate that all ADC codes are tested and the DNL will be less than plus or minus 0.75 LSB for all passing devices. The second nonlinearity is integral nonlinearity, or INL. INL is a measurement of how close the measured ADC transfer function compares to a straight line. To eliminate errors from gain and offset error, the measured transfer function is compared to an ideal straight line that is fit to the endpoints of the ADC transfer function. The deviation between the ideal line and the measured function is the INL error. In the specified example shown, the green dashed line is the endpoint fit of the transfer function. The reason it is called an endpoint fit is that the green line starts at the first code, 0000, and ends at the last code. 1111. For a perfectly linear ADC, the straight line would be directly down the middle of the ADC transfer function. In this case, however, you can see that the measured function shown in blue deviates away from the linear fit, so it is said to have a positive INL error. As with DNL error, the integral nonlinearity can be displayed versus the ADC output code. Integral nonlinearity may be given in units of LSB codes, or it may be given as a percentage of the full scale range. An example of the datasheet specification for INL, as well as a graph of typical integral nonlinearity for an ADC versus output code, are shown here. In the case of the datasheet table, the INL is tested for all codes and will be less than 1.5 LSBs. Devices with an INL error that exceeds 1.5 LSBs are discarded. The typical INL is an indication of the performance for most devices. The typical range is mathematically set during characterization to be plus or minus one standard deviation of the population. This means that about 68.3% of the population is within the typical range. Notice that the graph illustrates the typical integral nonlinearity in LSBs versus output code for this device. That concludes this video. Thank you for watching. Please try the quiz to check your understanding of this video's content.